This is the Mend It Pass podcast with Chadwick Hayward, episode 17. Welcome to MendItPass.com. Let's get back to bed. Hi, Path Menders. Thanks so much for tuning in to the 17th episode of the Mend It Pass podcast. This week, I am honored to bring you a most excellent conversation with two-time natural bodybuilding champion, Robert Cheek. Robert is considered one of Veg News Magazine's most influential vegan athletes and has a lot going on. He is founder and president of Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, and he is the best-selling author of the books Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, The Complete Guide to Building Your Body on a Plant-Based Diet, and his latest book, Shred It, Your Step-by-Step Guide to Burning Fat and Building Muscle on a Whole Food Plant-Based Diet. He is also working on a third book to be released later in 2017 called Plant-Based Muscle. In addition to writing and operating vegan bodybuilding and fitness, Robert gives lectures around the world and is a regular contributor to Vegan Health and Fitness Magazine, Naked Food Magazine, and Forks Over Knives. He is a multi-sport athlete and entrepreneur and has done all this while following a plant-based diet for over 20 years. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Chadwick. I appreciate you having me. It's great to have you on the show. Um, Most of my guests to date have, uh, like you, they lead a whole food plant-based diet. But a lot of them kind of got to their journey due to having weight issues or health issues. And I know your particular story is a little bit different. Um, But in the interest of like mending paths, for for them, it was mending a health path. For you, it was more of mending a ethical, moral path. Do you want to talk a little bit about what started you on your journey away from or into into veganism? Yeah, and, and beyond that, Chadwick, it was a personal pursuit path as far as my my fitness story. Yeah, um, absolutely, def- definitely a moral and ethical path. As I grew up on a farm and I got into animal rights when I was a teenager and became vegan in 1995 before the public internet was around. So, uh, you know, a bit of a learning curve back then for sure, without yeah. a lot of, you know, I can't Google something. I can't watch YouTube. Uh, I have to learn from other people. I have to have conversations. I have to have discussions. I think it was a, a really a good time to embark on this kind of lifestyle during a time when there weren't Uh, online resources and chat rooms and you had to have conversations with people at school or at home okay or at events so uh, I thought that was really neat so basically uh, my background is uh, growing up on a farm I was I raised animals for the the county fair you know and I had uh, the pets that were cows rabbits chickens different than a lot of other people who have pets as dogs or cats but my relationship with them and wasn't any different as far as uh, them having first names and being considered friends and, yeah. and part of the family. And really, it was once I had that realization that when I finished showing these specific animals, uh, ones that were uh, to be to be sold, um, once I, I finished at the county fair and sold them at the auction uh, for money, which was exciting as a kid to get some money as a 12, 13, 14 year old. Yeah. Uh, when I realized where they were going and where my friends were leading and they would be turned into somebody's meal, that didn't sit well with me. And so through my older sister's inspiration, she was vegetarian at a young age, then vegan before me, she encouraged me to adopt a vegan lifestyle. Uh, I didn't really know what that was. I just knew that I wanted to live in line with compassion and no longer eat or or exploit animals. And so I started learning about it. And so that was at 15. Yeah, age 15, 1995. So growing up on a farm, how did your parents feel about that? Uh, Not not so good, not super supportive. You also, uh, you you probably don't know and listeners may not know, uh, my parents met in the animal science department at Oregon State University, both of them grew up on farms and we lived on a farm and my dad, uh, he just retired, uh, a year or two ago from the university, but he was a world renowned expert on, um, animal production. He wrote 15 books for college students and spoke on six continents around the world, uh, teaching 
communities, people how to raise animals for food. Okay. So I clearly went went against the grain. Um, so my parents weren't necessarily super supportive at first. I think naturally, like a lot of parents are, they were a bit worried or nervous for my own health and well-being. Okay. I was barely, I weighed barely over a hundred pounds when I became vegan. I was a skinny, scrawny kid growing up, and now I'm no longer eating animal protein. And I, I think that that worried them a bit. And it took time for them to see that I was, I was doing okay with this lifestyle. Okay. So in time, they, they became more supportive of, of your choices. Yeah. I mean, fast forward 20 plus years later, they still you know, give me a hard time during the holidays for fun, but it's more in a joking manner and, um, uh, and more casual, but they certainly support where I've gone now that I've written books and been on magazine covers. And I've now toured around the world, giving presentations in Australia and Europe and Caribbean and Canada and all, all these places, I think they're, they have some level of, uh, of pride or, or satisfaction that um, though I went about things a different way, I was still able to pursue my own passions in life and uh, find some sort of level of success doing it. Okay. How, how do you like, do you, do you guys just not broach it around the dinner table? Because obviously it's opposing viewpoints, right? Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's holiday especially were always interesting with my family because my parents, farmers, uh, uh, and studying animal science, teaching animal science at the university, uh, my older sister, vegan, uh, me, a vegan, my youngest brother, vegetarian, and then my other brother, uh, younger than me, uh, is a cattle farmer. So we had oh, wow. a very diverse group. So my, my parents joked that only one of, one of their kids turned out right, uh, the one who's a cattle farmer, and he still is today. He, he uh, a cattle farmer out in the state of Oregon. And, and uh, you know, there were interesting, I mean, lots of interesting things. I mean, from even the vehicles. My, my brother with his big pickup truck and a gun rack that has bumper stickers that say, enjoy a juicy steak tonight, and my sister's. Uh, 1960s or 70s, whatever it is, Volkswagen bus uh, spray painted with the Beatles and rainbows and all this. <laughs> bumper, bumper stickers parked right next to my brother's truck that said, if you love animals called pets, why do you eat animals called dinner? And this uh, juxtaposition within my siblings, within my family was uh, very apparent and something that we persevered through holidays year after year with. We have traditional turkey and ham and all of this. And then we have tofurkey and, yeah. and vegan mashed potatoes and gravy with soy milk and, uh, you know, tofu based chocolate pudding and, uh, you know, foods would evolve over the years, but in the yeah. early nineties or late nineties and early two thousands, it was, um, you know, a lot of vegan version of this or that. Uh, and just interesting, interesting conversations, interesting interactions, um, especially with extended family, aunts and uncles, relatives who would come to holiday gatherings and they themselves were farmers or from that, certainly the non-vegan background as well. And so we were a bit isolated with the three of us, me, my brother and sister. But yeah. here we are, 21, 22 years later, my sister is still vegan and, and uh, now has a little vegan toddler, a uh, three-year-old. And my brother is still vegetarian uh, 20 something years later after becoming vegetarian at age 11. And he's leaning more towards vegan lifestyle these days. And, and here I am, uh, not a hundred pounds anymore, but 200 pounds, um, as a v vegan athlete. So, uh, yeah. so we made it out. Okay. So did, were those conversations open most of the time or was it, was it confrontational? You know, I wish I could say they were more open, but they were confrontational. And that is because of a number of factors. I believe that when you have a a life changing decision that that changes the course of your life, you become very passionate. And then this could yeah. be a, a born again, you know, fill in the blank religion. This could be uh, someone who is a meat eating farm kid and and overnight becomes an animal rights activist vegan. Uh, there, there's lots of analogies or scenarios you can plug in there, but because I had that switch uh, really powerfully watching videos of factory farming and animal testing, uh, reading literature, talking to people about animal rights and veganism, I was very passionate about that. I got, I gave presentations in school, got kicked out of class for being 
you know, confrontational oh, okay. uh, in, in my nature. And, and so I was confrontational with my brother, who's two years younger, and him being a, a, a cowboy with cowboy boots and belt, <laughs> belt buckle and cowboy hat and, uh, and you, know, you know, defending his lifestyle, um, we clashed quite a bit. We didn't even really talk in school. We didn't even, you know, make eye contact walking down the hall. I mean, it, okay. it was, you know, looking back, it's kind of sad, but, but that's, that's kind of how it was. And I would get angry at my parents for, uh, you know, you raised me this way. You raised me to kill animals and eat meat. You know, I resented that. Yeah. And a lot of that was, I was a 15, 16 year old, uh, high school kid who has emotions and reactions and, a different level of maturity than today. Yeah. And so I think it was a growing, there were growing pains for everybody, <laughs> for my parents, for sure. Like, how do we handle these guys? Um, for my siblings and our, you know, our relationship uh, with one another and with my relationships with my, with my friends and teachers and teammates at school, I had to oh, you know, just kind of, um, I don't know, uh, mend, mend that path and navigate through some choppy waters and make sure that, uh, I could get along with everybody. Okay. And, and, and sure enough, I did. So, yeah, I, I know a lot of people who are transitioning or, or starting their own journey. Like that, that's one of the biggest challenges is that, um, you're kind of like an Island in this ocean of culture that is counter to what we're living now. Um, and, and that can be difficult to seeing yourself as an island. Like wh what, what were some strategies that like you use to, to not go crazy? Well, with your, uh, analogy, uh, you have to remember the island back then was like Hawaii when now the island is for vegans is maybe like Australia. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, there just, there just weren't other vegan people that I knew of. There weren't other vegan athletes there, it was, a, it was much more of an island back then before the internet and, um, and being a, a, a school kid. Yeah. Um, the only people I knew were kids I went to school with or had 4-H program with or after school sports activity or whatever hobby I was involved in. That's, that was were my only interactions, not Facebook uh, or YouTube or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, I think the most important thing was that I was just true to myself and, what I wanted to do and what direction I wanted to go with my life. And, uh, and I, I pursued that with passion and with confidence. And I've always thought that it's, you know, one of the easiest things in the world is not to believe in something and not to stand for something and to give up or give in or just follow what everybody else is doing. Uh, but one of the hardest things to do is to believe in yourself and believe in something. And so I think when observers, your friends, family, classmates, uh, colleagues, coworkers, when they see somebody believing strongly in something, that, that is a pretty reasonable idea, I should clarify. But when when you, you see people passionate about doing good, it's it's hard to criticize those people because we look inward and say, wow, look at this amazing work people are doing to help the homeless or help the poor or help yeah. veterans or help animals or you know, you know, that kind of thing people doing good and making contributions and donating their time, their resources, their, their, their money, their effort, uh, their heart, whatever. I think it's hard to criticize those people. Um, uh, as long as the, the idea that they are supporting is worth supporting. It's, it's not super controversial. It's, it's an, a, an act of goodwill. It's in good faith. It's, it's to make the world a better place. And so, I found that if I just did that, if I was just a passionate vegan person and, and not, you know, I had my bumps in the road where I was a little bit more aggressive or assertive or blaming other people for their contributions to animal suffering and, and, and uh, environmental uh, destruction and, and this kind of thing through their actions. Once I got through those, those periods of time, I was just a happy, enthusiastic, passionate, fun kid. And I became fairly well liked and, and fairly uh, successful athlete. And people saw that I could do that as a high school athlete playing varsity sports and on some of the top teams in the entire state. 
and doing this all on a vegan diet, plant-based or vegan lifestyle, plant-based diet. And it certainly piqued interest in a number of people and, and a number of my teammates, classmates adopted a vegan lifestyle as well. Oh, that's pursued awesome. Running, tennis, other sports. I was able to, I'm quite proud of the fact that I was able to work with our athletic departments, uh, PE, physical education, uh, teachers to get um, rubber and synthetic leather materials, um, footballs, basketballs used in school rather than ones that had leather or animal products in them. So okay. I was involved, you know, I was involved in a lot of stuff in the community to show that there were alternatives to leather soccer shoes or using leather basketballs or leather footballs. There were there were many other options that people could do. And, and, and that was another part or step in that process. Okay. And so, so I take it that once you get over that initial, the hurt of uh, once you realize like what, what's actually happening and you're, you're hurt and you're, you're angry. And uh, once you, that you come to terms with that and really approach it with a positive outlook and, and, and try to have passion and, and do good, then it's less crazy for you. Like it, it's less internal. Yeah. In, in a, summarize in a few words, it's lead by positive example. Yeah. And yes, there are going to be some things that bother you or that make you upset and all of that. But you have, I think one thing we have to remember is that, it, I mean, if we come from a place of trying to create change, especially let's say within factory farming or, or making a difference for animals, we have to realize that, uh, that you know, animals don't care why we become vegan or how outspoken we are and, and how much we give ourselves a pat on the back or how many Facebook and Twitter statuses we upload that make us feel good, but they care that we make a difference. Yeah. And so whether we call ourselves plant-based and still, you, you know, wear our old leather shoes we've had for 10 years, or we're hardcore animal rights activists and take a hard line stance that, um, you know, everything's got to go, even, you know, stuff that, is no longer contributing to animal suffering. It already happened many, many years ago with yeah. old an old belt, old shoes or whatever. Um, that's for us to decide as individuals and how we feel about our own actions. Animals don't care about that. They don't care how hardcore you think you are or how awesome you think you are or look at all this great work that I'm doing. They just care that the work is effective. Yeah. And I found that I had to objectively evaluate my own actions. I thought I was pretty cool being um, really outspoken and getting kicked out of class and look what I'm doing for animals and all this. Did I turn a lot of people onto it with those tactics? Maybe not. Did I turn people off from, from vegan lifestyle? Maybe so Yeah. by being just a happy, uh, plant-based vegan successful athlete. Did I impact people in a different way by leading by a positive example? Probably. I'd like, I'd like to think so. And so that's what I would tell people. That was your question. Chadwick was how do people manage this in transitioning. And I think it's, you, you come to peace within yourself and objectively look at your own actions and behaviors and say, how, how can I best make a difference? What, what's the, what's the best return on investment of my actions that will help people adopt your health, healthier lifestyle and maybe save their lives? Um, and how can I make a difference for animals, for the planet, for the environment? And what actions will give me the best bang for my buck or the, the best return from my my individual action and if we answer that in a really thoughtful way i think we can do tremendous things yeah. to make a difference for whatever cause it is that we're trying to make a difference for we just have to realize that we should have a desire to be effective not to always be right or not to always be self-serving or to give ourselves a pat on the back but what does the most good yeah, that that's really well said because I think yeah a lot of people approach it as like they they get kind of overwhelmed for I'll call it in in an accounting term the sunk cost right so their past actions are sunk cost there's nothing they can do to change that but they they get upset for maybe stuff they've done that now they feel bad because it's not congruent with the way they want to live the rest of their life but there's nothing you can really do about that you really need to look forward and and try to figure out how you can have the best positive impact going forward no that's that's awesome so you've decided that that you wanted to live to put on a whole bunch of weight that's kind of uh something that a lot of people you you get the protein question all the time that uh and like your parents said that they expected you to be way too skinny with uh this kind of lifestyle but 
you buck that trend and you prove that that wasn't the case. So what, what kind of led you up to wanting to become a bodybuilder? Well, it's a good question because it, it actually comes from a, 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 a place of deep meaning. Um, even if now reflecting back, it seems a little bit silly, but that's who I was and what my passion was at the time. Uh, I know a lot of people don't these days don't, don't seek to put on a whole bunch of weight or, or a whole bunch of, mu- you know, muscle. Um, but some people do, of course, and, and athletes especially can, many athletes can benefit from adding 10 or 20 pounds of muscle. It makes them more effective in their sport, whether that's football or basketball or soccer or whatever the yeah. case is. And so for me, growing up, I was a skinny, scrawny kid. So what do I naturally want to do? I want to be bigger and stronger, you know, just like people I think who grew up, uh, I don't know. I've never been in this place, but people who and you've interviewed a bunch, so maybe, you know, but people who have been overweight or maybe significantly overweight, even f- since when they were a kid, they want something different. You know, they've always yeah. been that way. And maybe they've been picked on or teased because of that way. And there's no different for me. You know, I was picked on and teased for being little. I was pushed around a lot. I, I, in sports, it was challenging if I could get knocked over pretty easily. I was just uh, you know, a late grower, late bloomer. I was smaller and I just wanted to get bigger and stronger. And I just happened to grow up in the era of pro wrestling with Hulk Hogan, the ultimate warrior, macho man, yeah. Ric Flair, all these guys. And so I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to be a big, strong pro wrestler on TV. This will allow me to, uh, to uh, fulfill this goal of being bigger and stronger. I can, I can maybe become famous. I'll be on television. <laughs> I get to dress up in a costume and and have theme music. Wow, wouldn't this be cool? And so that's what I, that's what what, I, what got me interested. I thought, well, if I'm going to be a pro wrestler, I need to get bigger and stronger. I was already a pretty pretty good athlete. I was a five sport athlete in high school, and I went on to run uh, cross country distance running in college for a year. And then I just decided around age 19, I had been vegan for four or five years, and I thought, you know what? I really want to get, I just want to pursue this weightlifting right now. I actually didn't know about the sport of bodybuilding. I wasn't familiar with it. I just wanted to lift weights and maybe become a pro wrestler someday. Yeah. So it was a means to an end. Yeah, exactly. And so I started lifting weights and that's when I discovered through a friend, the sport of bodybuilding that people would actually lift weights, get strong and then, and then flex on a stage and get awarded prizes and recognition and magazine features and all that. And so I thought, well, that sounds fun. Um, you know, this will help my pro wrestling pursuit, or if that doesn't work out, I, at least I can fall back on bodybuilding and and maybe pursue that. And so that's, and so that's what I did. I, it was all because I wanted to get bigger and stronger for myself, my personal pursuit that I mentioned the very beginning of our conversation. And, and, and then I, I found a way to effectively, promote the lifestyle that I had been so passionate about for years, that the vegan lifestyle through sports and bodybuilding was a great avenue to do that because I didn't really know anybody else that was doing it. And it gave me a platform to showcase that here I just put on 75 pounds in a short amount of time, five years or so, whatever the case was. uh, And I completely transformed my body and my life doing it in ways that people said that couldn't be done. Yeah. You, you, you must have copious amounts of animal protein. You must eat meat, drink lots of milk. Your milk does the body good. You get bigger and stronger. These are all the messages that I was given. And I thought that there was another way. And I, I experimented with it and I worked really hard and things seemed to turn out. Okay. So I know like a plant-based diet is calorically dilute. So were you just eating all the time or like, how, how did you ensure you were in a calorie surplus to put on muscle? Yeah, well, this this is a great question and allows me to share a really quick story. When I first got into bodybuilding or weightlifting, let's call it, because I, I, I didn't know about bodybuilding then, I I was enthusiastic. I mean, I was I was excited, and I lifted weights. I even took some uh, plant based sports supplements um, that I found at the store, in the nutrition store, and I, I was, you know. Um, you know, protein powders or whatever, yeah. um, nutrition. I don't even know what they were, but uh, it's, you know, Yohimbi extract. I don't even know what the benefit of that is. I can't even remember now, <laughs> but it was popular in magazines, and, you know, so I, I took it. It was plant-based. So I, okay, I'll try this. So my point is I was enthusiastic 
And after one year, I gained about one pound. Oh, wow. And that was pretty deflating. And uh, I wasn't super enthusiastic with my results. And then I tried a different program, like the, you know, the very next week. And here I am a whole year, age 19 through 20 or so. And I didn't, I didn't make much progress. And so I, I just happened to discover the Bill Phillips Body for Life program. It was this 12-week challenge with all these before and after photos. And I found that to be pretty inspiring. Like, wow, look, I could, I could turn into this, you know, before and after transformation challenges. This is the late nineties. This is, you know, these people are getting featured in books and they're inspiring people. And so I followed this program and it basically, if you're not familiar with that, it's eating six meals per day and working out six times per week. Okay. And I ended up gaining 19 pounds during the 12 weeks I continued, I kept going and gained 28 pounds over 10 months and became officially a bodybuilder after that. Then I would go on to put on another 10 pounds and sure enough, I was 195 pounds and I won my first bodybuilding competition a few years, a few years later. And so what happened was I had to look back, what was going on that first year uh, that, that I gained, I made no progress. Well, what was going on was that I was only remembering the times that I went to the gym you know, feeling good about it. Maybe that was only once or twice a week. Oh, okay. I would conveniently forget about all the times I didn't go. <laughs> I was hanging out till three in the morning, hanging out, you know, with spending time with friends, eating junk food, um, not documenting what I was consuming. I was just eating a bunch of sesame seed bagels and, and Hanson's or blue sky, natural soda <laughs> and some spaghetti and, uh, vegan Eve's veggie cuisine, to- tofu hot dogs and you know, I didn't know much about nutrition. I didn't know much about training. In fact, I didn't do very, very, either one very well. And, and that's why I, I didn't progress. And then as soon as I was held accountable and said, okay, you want to follow this program, you got to eat six times a day. You've got to consume enough calories to build muscle. And then you need to be in the gym on a regular basis. Yeah. In, in this case, it was six days a week. Some of those were, uh, I think at least one or two of those were just cardiovascular training days, but they were still workout days. And I was held accountable to my fitness and nutrition schedule. And that's what allowed me to make incredible progress. And that's what I've written about in the books that I've written and published since then is that I learned that the most important lesson I learned in my entire journey was during that period of failure and temptation of just giving up. It's the easiest thing to do. Robert, this isn't in the cards for you. You're a skinny vegan kid. You're a pretty good runner. Stick with that. Don't, don't tread too far out of your comfort zone in, into a world of weightlifting that you know nothing about. Um, you're bound to fail. Um, you're you're not going to succeed anyway. Don't waste your time or don't don't get your hopes up or anybody else's hopes up that you can do this, especially as a vegan, You, you need to stick to what you're used to and what you're good at. Yeah, that was an easy answer. The, the harder a- answer was to find something that worked. And so the most important lesson that I learned was that transparency, consistency and accountability were the absolute recipe for figuring anything out, whether we're talking about learning a language, learning a new skill like auto mechanics or building our body, either burning fat or building muscle. We have to be transparent about who we are and what we're really doing, even if reality hurts, even if the, the truth that we just eat way too much junk food, we're not in the gym, we, we don't have good work ethic, we're lazy, whatever the case is, we're distracted. Uh, you know, we, we have to come to terms with that. We have to at least face that yeah. if we want to make a, a change. And it's not always easy to hear. And it's hard to be critical uh, on yourself. It's hard. To, it's hard to criticize yourself and resolve to do something about it. But once I was able to do that, I could write books, I could, I could build muscle. I could burn fat. I could create my own business. I could travel the world. I just had to figure out who I was and what I was doing and what was holding me back and what was pushing me forward and then make the decisions to follow the actions that were pushing me forward and discard the actions that were holding me back and everything changed from that moment. Yeah. So yeah, the first step is taking a realistic assessment of, of where you are and, and breaking down your own barriers, the lies you tell yourself to, to make you feel good and, and kind of figure out because you can't get where you're going if you don't know where you are. Right. I, I, right. I say that all the time. Right? Your path ahead is, is not going to be clear if you, 
if you don't know it. I think it, that that reminded me of a Chinese proverb where it's like a man dreams of a thousand paths, but wakes up and walks the old one, right? So yeah. unless you're willing to create a formula essentially to get where you're going, you're you're going to end up uh, falling into old habits. And and yeah, any any success um, is the result of consistent effort towards that goal. And I would add, not being afraid to try something unfamiliar, especially if it means a lot to you. Yeah. Uh, you you may have no business running a marathon, but if you work at it, you could. You may have no business uh, pursuing another sports interest, but if you work at it, you you might get a lot better. And, and that's I think true in. In many areas of, of life, uh, fitness is just one catalyst. There's just one platform, uh, whether we're talking about muscle building or weight loss or, or fat loss or having more energy or, or getting better at a sport. I, I think that translates to other areas of life and it builds confidence that I've been, you know, I've been down this road before and now I can take a new road pursuing something different, even if it's a little bit scary and it's a little bit unknown. Okay. And, and that's where I think that your comment on a, a thousand paths, it's to get a little bit outside your comfort zone. If it's if you're interested in it, if you care about it, try something new and, and try a new path. And uh, if it doesn't work out, it, you know, you try it and you learn from it and you can take another path from there. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you do have like a, a lot on the go and that the thousand paths kind of touches on it a bit here where like you, you do a lot of speaking, you do, you write books, you've, you've got your website, you're obviously in the gym fairly frequently. Um, do you find that you have better success balancing like all of those kind of things at once? Or do you like pick particular days and it's like, today's a book day and, and that's what I'm going to do today. Like how, how do you balance all those, um, multiple responsibilities? I think the balance is an understanding that we all have 1,440 minutes in a day to do what we want to do or do what we, what obligations we have, or what we, what we plan to do. And so I have an awareness of that. And, and I think just having that awareness of, okay, um, I've got this amount of time and so does everybody else. Yeah. H- how can I allocate my time to do things that are really productive. And so I do have a lot going on and some things I'm better at than others because you could argue maybe I'm spread too thin or I haven't spent time to learn enough uh, about something um, like technology, as, as we discussed through email before <laughs> chatting for the first time today, there are certain things that have left me behind in technology because I've been busy writing books and meeting with people, shaking hands face to face, interacting with people and building relationships yeah. and doing other things that, okay, I'm not, I'm not as good on a smartphone as somebody else. But, um, while people can be spending all their time reading notifications, maybe I'm producing a new 300 page book that could inspire thousands and thousands of people. Um, and, and not that one action is better than others. There's, I spend copious amounts of time on my smart smartphones too. <laughs> um, engaging with people, answering questions, learning more about what, what interests people in my space yeah. of vegan health and fitness. So, you know, I think I just approach each day with every activity has a return on investment. Um, every podcast interview, every magazine interview, every time I sit down and edit a new book or, or, or have a meeting or go on tour there's some sort of return on investment and some are going to be better than others. And some are, are deliberately uh, maybe less effective on the surface level, but then they open up doors later on down the road. Yeah. Even, I mean, an easy example from the, let's say business standpoint, easy example is I was on tour last week, uh, at one of those two day vegan festivals yeah. and my actual sales weren't very good. Um, you know, that's just how it goes sometimes. You know, I sell books and t-shirts and tank tops and, you know, clothing for my brand and, yeah. and, uh, and all that. But my, my, my sales weren't all that great, but I made some, some connections there that are, are proving to be very, very valuable as I move forward, writing new books and, and tremendous connections with, uh, best-selling authors, literary agents, successful entrepreneurs. Yeah. I was able to make those contacts, even though at times it felt like a waste of time. I'm just standing around here. I'm not selling a lot of stuff. I'm maybe spending more on my uh, event um, 
you know, the, the, the cost to have a booth and hotel and, and fuel and travel to get there and all this stuff. But, yeah. but, but there's, there's another return on investment. And so, and so I just look at those kind of things where some days it makes sense to spend all day on Facebook and Twitter and answering questions, promoting items, uh, announcing new projects. Uh, and it does, it does not feel like a waste of time at all. In fact, it's highly productive and it's can be, can lead to tremendous results. Other times it feels like a complete waste of time. Like Robert, <laughs> what are you doing, man? Yeah. You're, you're, you're behind schedule with your new book. Um, the, the bigger ROI, let's say from an impact standpoint or bi- even business standpoint, once you release a new book, it's going to be way more successful than this little promotions you're doing to try to sell a few t-shirts today. Yeah. Robert, what are you doing? Like reallocate, get focused. Um, quit nickel and dime in your way through when you have big projects on the verge and just get those done. I have these conversations internally and, you know, I might even talk to myself sitting here at the desk like, Robert, let's just get focused. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, I, I do juggle a lot of stuff, uh, but even when I'm in the gym, I do, I do the same thing. I say, I get, I can sometimes get distracted. I'm at the gym, I'm working hard, but I'm also promoting on Twitter that I'm at the gym. I'm, yeah. I'm taking a photo because I've got a super, I'm super pumped up and, and I want to show that I'm still relevant. I retired from bodybuilding years ago, but look, I'm still relevant. So I take a flexing photo and then I upload that. And then I got to see what kind of comments people leave. And, yeah. and all of a sudden what happened to my workout <laughs> and, and, and what happens to my intensity? What happens to my focus? It got distracted by superficial, arbitrary actions that don't really mean a whole lot, except they give me a, a, a potential pat on the back and, you know, I feel good for the next hour or so. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's hard to measure the success of something like that, right? Like maybe, maybe that picture, you got a new person that was going to, that had a big network themselves and we're going to open you up to another hundred thousand people. Right. But you, d- you don't know sure. that. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and actually, uh, I, I had this great, you know, from my perspective, um, cause I've been working hard recently and overcoming an injury that happened earlier th- or this past year, I should say yeah. in the spring, um, I had a gr- this great muscle pump. And so I, I took this photo and uploaded it last Friday and you're right. What the, uh, the most famous or, or one of the most famous, most popular, successful poker players in the world, Daniel Negrano also happens to be vegan and has hundreds of thousands of followers and pretty big impact. He, um, he shared that photo or commented on that photo and it did reach a whole bunch of other people. And now just yesterday he was introducing me to other people through Twitter. Hey, you know, at Robert, she can answer that for you. Oh, um, awesome. He's been doing this for 20 years. And you know, it's from one photo where I just look super ripped and I have veins that through my arms and abs that pop out. And I was pumped up from the middle of a workout. So at the time it was a silly photo in the mirror at the gym, but, but, but maybe you're right. Maybe that did reach thousands of people who never thought that vegans could build muscle. Um, and now they believe they can from one image. But at the time, I saw it as well. You know, I should be back out there lifting weights, yeah. not um, wasting time taking a couple silly photos that my community is used to seeing anyway. Yeah, well, it comes back to the old adage. The the executive says, half of my advertising budget is wasted. The problem is I don't know which half. <laughs> yeah. Right? So. Oh, I run into that scenario all the time. Yeah. Where... I, I mean, and I haven't heard I haven't heard that expression before until you said it just now. But I can I recognize that in my own actions as someone who tries to promote books, tries to promote a business, tries to pr- promote a brand, and and not fully understanding what's doing the best job, yeah, and, and what's a waste of time or money. And it's it's hard to measure that success. So what like do you try to reevaluate say every morning, or is it like once a week where you're you're planning your week ahead, or is it? Does it fly during the day and you're like, okay, I, I've, I've been on Facebook for the last 20 minutes and this is not working for me. I'm going to switch over. Yeah, it's – I'm such a day-by-day kind of person. Okay. Uh, I can't help it. I just – I mean even scheduling this call, we, we did it within, what, 72 hours? We're like, okay, let's just do it on this day. Yeah, it was yeah. really quick. And uh, and I and I'm doing a, a Facebook Live video with a couple champion vegan athletes right after we get off this call uh they're showing up at my house and we're we're setting up awesome the camera and we're doing that and that was decided yesterday um i had a meeting yesterday with a book editor 
lasted for about three hours. That was decided the day before, but it was a tremendous meeting, gave me so much more clarity, so much so that I was at the gym before the meeting. I went to the meeting, had dinner with my co-author and book editor, and I came back and decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to the gym, but I'm just going to sit in the sauna because that's where I get my thinking done. That's okay. where I come up with my best, my best book ideas. My, that's where I get my, usually my best ideas is when I just sit there in the sauna at the gym and sweat. It's quiet. And I just think, cause I, I can't play on my phone. It's too hot. The phone shuts off. I know cause I've tried it many times. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, uh, I can't, I can't watch TV. Um, I haven't even had a TV for 15 years oh, at wow. my house until I got one a week ago. Um, but I didn't have one for 15 years. And I think that's been part of my benefit and focus for being on the right. But, you know, I went to a place where I could do some more thinking because that meeting was so productive. I didn't plan to go back to the gym, but I thought of it on the spot. And I don't know exactly what I'll be doing later today. I, I thought I might hop online and do some sort of promotion for our new no meat, no problem clothing, some sort of incentives um, because that would boost business. But then again, it could take away from the momentum of my book editing that we're, we are in the editing stages of a new book. And that's I want to honor that that process and where we are in that process. So yeah. I am, I'm a bit scattered in that way. And I think it's, I, I think that's a, a shortcoming in a lot of ways, but um, I think it, it does have some benefits because it keeps me involved in a lot at one time. So if, if I put all my effort into one project and it didn't work, yeah, then I'm kind of stuck at least yeah. for a while. But because I have so many efforts going on at once, uh, you know, a few of them turn out pretty well. You're seeing little gains. Could one of those efforts be better if I really focus on just that? Probably, but um, that's also a big risk too. And so, so yeah, I, I just kind of evaluate things really honestly. I mean, hour by hour. You know, yeah. What do I feel like doing now? What's a good use of my time right now? Um, how long do I want to work out today? Um, do I want to tack on an extra 45 minutes? of cardio on the Stairmaster or do I want to get home and get back to work? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a day by day. Well, I, I kind of use that approach as well. And I, I think it's beneficial because it ensures that you're doing something passionate all the time. Whereas like if I sat down on Monday and said, okay, on Thursday, I'm going to be writing three chapters, let's say for, for argument's sake. Um, and I wake up Thursday and I really don't want to write, but I, I stick to my schedule. Then I'm not going to produce the same kind of quality of work as if I was true to myself and what you really wanted to do. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a couple of things there. There's some pros and cons. Um, <laughs> when you are scheduled, let's say for, for writing, even if it's not your most inspired work, you still get something done. Yeah. Whereas sometimes if you just wait until your, your, your passion is there, a month could go by and nothing got done on the book or whatever project it is. So yeah. that's why I just hesitate there for a minute, just because that's from my experience, there is something to be said for having some sort of structure, at least for certain types of pro projects where you chip away at it every day and yeah. eventually you get it done. And, but then, but I also fully agree that you want to be doing passionate work. You want to be excited in the moment. And a perfect example is when I was bodybuilding, Working out felt like a chore a lot of times. It's one of the reasons I retired from it. It was I had such high pressure I placed on myself and so much expectation that I put on my shoulders as one of the only vegan bodybuilders out there that I didn't even want to go to the gym anymore, but I knew I had to yeah. because that's the only way I was going to make progress and represent myself and the community in a way that would make people proud. And I resented it. I disliked it. I would be you know, frowning at the gym. I couldn't wait to leave. You turned and that happened because it, it became too much work. It became too much a burden. And not that I'm lazy or that I couldn't take it. I just needed a break. And yeah. now, you know, now I, I took a break. I retired from bodybuilding. Now I train for the fun of it. I enjoy it. And I'm actually bigger and stronger than I was when I was a competitive bodybuilder because I think I'm having more fun. That's awesome. So, uh, so anyway, that's just a side story to add to your, um, your comment. That's awesome. Have you decided on a title for your book or is that a hush hush? No, it's, we've been working on it for a year. The title is plant-based muscle. Plant-based muscle. Okay. Yeah. Plant-based muscle. So this one does not have the word vegan in the title. It's um, designed to appeal to the growing plant-based community. And, um, and the, the subtitle is something like 
I forget exactly, but um, tools to build your body and you know achieve your fitness goals, something like that. Awesome. But using the word tools in there because it's a very hold your hand step by step book. I, I re, I'm writing, I'm co-authoring with Vanessa Espinoza, my training partner. She's a champion vegan athlete, uh, three time state uh, boxing champion, all American basketball player, drafted into the WNBA. Um, I mean, success around every corner. She's been yeah. vegan for 15 years. Uh, tremendous person and, and wonderful friend and athlete and training partner, co-author. And we understood that three days ago was the most popular day that people gave up on their New Year's resolutions. Yeah. Uh, you know, January, January 17th. We realized that people people need a little bit extra help. They need to be told what to do. So I'm, now I'm plant-based or now I'm trying to exercise and lose weight or build muscle. What the heck do I do? What do I, what exercises do I do? Yeah. How many repetitions? What do I do on Tuesday? It can be overwhelming when you're new. Right. And so this book is heavily focused on exercises and exercise demonstrations and full of color photos and district and descriptions and, um, and training programs for very specific outcomes of, of fat burning or muscle building or, um, conditioning. Uh, there, there's so much to it. Um, and so and at the moment, we, we plan to release this one as a full color ebook okay. because there's so much we can do with the full color photos with the workout aspect and, and even the food and meal prep and meal plans and recipe aspect, too, that, that I think we can produce something that's really visually stunning and effective. And, and the only cost effective way to do that is in a digital format. All of my other books are, are print copies that can be found in stores or Amazon or online or whatever. But this one, we really wanted to focus on taking out the guesswork and and walking people through this process. So January 17th doesn't have to come around. You don't have to give up on, the, on your New Year's resolutions or your summertime resolutions or your overcoming injury and time to get fit or reclaiming your health and reclaiming your life and burning fat. Um, and reversing disease or whatever the case is, you don't have to be stuck. You don't have to be isolated. You don't have to not know what to do. We want to provide the tools to help you get it done. And so it's been, it's been fun to write and, and to take that different approach where, um, it's not really my story anymore. I don't have to share my story of, of skinny farm kid, a champion vegan bodybuilder. People know that story. Yeah. Uh, and now I can just go into the building blocks of what it, it took to do that on a more comprehensive level. And furthermore, Vanessa actually has the strongest voice in the book. I'm I'm the narrator. I'm the storyteller. I'm the writer. But she creates all the workout programs okay. and training programs because she is a – I mean if you just see photo, photos of her, you'll see why. Um, she's just an incredible athlete with one of the best physiques on the planet. And is a long time compassionate vegan as well. And yeah. so as a personal trainer of 10 years or more, she has a strong voice in the book, guiding people through the steps to achieve the results they're looking for. And then I go in there with the narration and say, Hey, you know, it's going to take things like transparency, accountability, consistency, how bad you want it. What's your passion? How, how much are you willing to work for it and keep you're the motivator? Yeah. I, I love that kind of stuff. I, yeah. that's, that's the tone of my writing is that you can do it because I've been there when nobody thought that I could. Yeah. And you know, I did it anyway and, and I can show you how and why my approach has worked not only for me, but for the thousands of people who have gone on to believe in themselves after reading my books. And, and now we're just putting the tools together for people. And so when is that expected to hit the digital shelves? Yeah, the digital shelves, um, hopefully late spring, early summer. I and mean, I'd love to say earlier. And of course, as every writer will say, our goal was to get it out by the new year. And that certainly didn't happen. So uh, we discussed this in detail yesterday. We, we have deadlines. We have timelines. We have th these targets we're reaching for. And if all goes well with all the peer reviews and endorsements from athletes, uh, doctors, celebrities, whatever, um, and, and peer reviews from experts and colleagues in our, in our area. Yeah. Uh, we should get this out by June, I would say. So awesome. it's a way, I mean, it's a little ways away, but that's how books work. You know, you want it to be good. It's, it's out there. It's, it's available for public criticism and praise and 
to be scrutinized and you want it to be good work. People are paying for a product. You want it to be worth their hard earned money and we don't want to cut shortcuts or, or make it come out before it's ready. So, Absolutely. um, it, it takes a bit of patience. And for those who are not authors or writers, I know I, I under, I totally understand that it's sometimes it's frustrating. You hear about this exciting book. It's been hyped up for months. <laughs> when can I get it? Well, yeah. you know, when it's done and that's going to be a while is, is the answer. It's, it is for almost every writer that I know. Uh, so, so, so I'm, I'm going to say June of 2017 It's about six months from the time that we're on the, the call right now. Yeah. I, I think, uh, the buildup adds value to it as well. It's like the planning well, and, for a vacation and, adds to the, fun yeah. of the vacation, right? Right. Well, and I think when, when people can hear me talk about some of the reasons why it, it takes a while, because yeah. you want it to be good. I mean, my last book was endorsed by 28 world-renowned experts, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr., uh, Rich Roll, Rip Esselstyn, Juliana Hever, um, all kinds of people, Big forks names. over knives. That, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, well, and people that know what they're know what they're talking about. You know, yeah. it, 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 and I got great feedback from Dr. Michael Greger from NutritionFacts.org. I got great feedback from Dr. T. Colin Campbell. I got endorsements and feedback from Forks Over Knives. I and then then you tack in some some fun people. I got endorsement from the uh, the lead guitarist for Def Leppard, oh, uh, awesome. who's vegan and, and a friend and colleague, and actress Emily Deschanel, and 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 Daniel Negreanu, who I mentioned earlier, the, the most famous or most winningest, highest earnings poker player in history. And you tack on some of those people who believe in your message and and give you some feedback and add a little bit of. of star power behind it too and and it, it it goes places so that's what that's what we're working on we're trying to make a good quality product to get out that's there. awesome i'm excited for it so i uh, one more question for you if someone's sure. about to start their journey this is this is one i throw out there every time someone's about to start their journey what's one piece of advice you would have for a path mender my advice is to ask yourself why you're doing it and you can't just say to lose weight or to get in shape or to feel good. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does losing weight mean for you? What does having more energy, how does that affect your life in a deep, meaningful way? How does uh, building confidence or achieving something, how does that factor into the big picture of your life? You, you have to find a meaningful reason behind it. Because as I said earlier, the easiest thing in the world is to give up and stop yeah. and quit. But but if you have this passion, this deep, meaningful reason of pursuit, you are much more likely to stick with it. And the more you stick with it, the more consistent you are, the more your body and mind and, and everything else adapts, the more you improve and the more likely you are to succeed and achieve. And so you've got to ask yourself why. So when things get tough, when things get frustrating, when you're spinning your wheel, when you want to give up, you remind yourself why you're doing it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So not to have vague goals, but to have smart goals, right? Specific. It's got to be specific. You got to just keep – once you answer it, you ask why again. Yeah. Why does that matter? Then you ask, you answer that and you ask why again and you get to the root of what, what powers you to make a change in your life. And it, it's, a, it's a very powerful thing. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and, and sharing your story and, and talking with us today. Thank you, Chadwick. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Mend it Pass podcast at www.menditpass.com. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider rating and reviewing us on iTunes. Thank you so much. See you all next time. Visit Mendipass.com and get back to Mendipass.com.